What is going on ladies and gents, let's take a look at those George W's on AMC and GME playing out for Monday. I'm a data scientist here in Silicon Valley, that's Professor Meatball, his snazzy tie with the tie clip shows that the odds are in our favor. So if you guys have already slapped that like to get this video out to as many people as possible, by the end of this video, I'm going to talk about what on a momentum base level, a fundamental base level, and finally on the options and implied volatility we are going to need to understand for Monday's price action. All right, what exactly is the reason behind the after hours IV pump that we all saw AMC and Jamie run up 15, 30% respectively, and the secret of 741. Before that, you guys know what to do. Slap that like to get the video out to as many people as possible, and let's get going. Let's take a look at AMC bottoming out together here is December 14th and right now at about $20 or so. You can zoom in a little bit to see those levels of supports more steadily. But the point is that we have now caught a macro support level here. Let's just zoom in a tiny bit to see AMC a little bit better. You'll notice that this macro pattern that has been taking place across an entire month is the best sign of a bullish movement up. And where is it going to likely move up on Monday? Let's take a look at the 30 minute chart. We'll have these levels of resistances that AMC was knocked down by on, on the 6th of trading. So we have 23.95, we have 24.61, and we have 25.63, all the way back up to $30. So we're taking a look at fewer and fewer resistances on the way back up to the 30 big ones. For GME, similar case, right? We have December 14th acting as the last time we reached the level of support around the 120s, high 120s. Now we are getting to that same level of support again, right, at 120s. This actually is the no man's land that GME has barely spent any time in. The only exceptions are, of course, in March, a couple of times right there, but still supported on a macro scale. And then finally, right now. So what happened? right after March's explosive movement upward. We stayed above $200, got all the way up to 250, 569, and this is currently what you should be looking forward to. Oh, right, I said by the end of the video, we'll be able to understand what IV is, what implied volatility and the options chain is. They posted before about how P Thomas Peter Fye clearly talking about exercising call options, and now they find the random video of Charles Gradante was allegedly suppressed, a video that he plainly plays out. Call options are absolutely market makers day up last January. They see all this happening. And just a few days later, we have this after hours craziness with MSM and pushing out NFT news as an explanation. Yep, I'm looking at it right here. Meme stocks me cryptomania with GameStop pursuing NFTs. It was only a matter of time before the turbocharged world of meme stock and crypto trading collided in a bust in a burst of speculative frenzy. Okay, so it seems like there is already a cause and effect, right? A need for knowing why would a stock push 30% in after hours and a perfectly convenient reason. We've already explained in the last video, go check it out if you haven't, uh, that we posted on Friday. Now, that was likely a scapegoat reason. But now we are getting to this part of the thumbnail here, obligatory, you are here in this red zone. Ignoring the variant swaps DD, they want to be very clear and explain to you that the reason they, that call options played such a big role in the January sneeze and why DRS and call options are a death blow to shorts, we need to learn from history, not just GME's initial sneeze, but also from another short squeeze example, the Volkswagen short squeeze. This is the chart of that Volkswagen short squeeze right here. Probably seen the articles that explain VW short squeeze occurred in 2008. One fateful day, uh, Porsche announced that it essentially locked up 74 percent of the float causing shorts to scramble and close out you've also heard that rc has tweeting that 741 as a nod to this number personally they think the theory is the right answer 74.1 percent okay here's the thing the final catalyst that kicked off the volkswagen short squeeze wasn't just that porsche owned 74 percent of the float in fact, they didn't. They had accumulated shares representing 43% of the float, but in a turn of events, they also purchased call options for shares equivalent to 31% of the float. That's right. VW sneeze was kicked off in part by an enormous purchase of call options. 
So the responses of this would be, how do we know that market makers are even delta hedging? The fact is, they probably aren't. According to this guy, Charles, that's what happened in January. Market makers weren't hedging calls initially. It got to a point where they couldn't ignore it and they had to start hedging, at least partially. And here is why. If you are confused about what delta hedging is, it's the essence of you want to catch up to a bet by putting yourself in the same place of the person that you place a bet against. Because ultimately, when a call option gets to the strike price, right, if it was out of the money, you could have just been buying shares of it to be able to cut your losses short. At a point, you could end up scot-free by not having any amount of debt from the person that you took a bet against. However, if you just leave it naked, if you don't ride the horse in both directions, you could be ending up with a potential infinite amount of debt, amount of money that you owe because the shares get more and more expensive. The rules that govern call options halved are different than the rules governing regular shares at settlement. We are keenly aware that when you buy shares, they can delay delivery by over a month before there are any real consequences. Even then, there are millions of ways for them to keep kicking that can. That's why we've been seeing and dealing with all year. It's plain as day that they can hide FTDs out of view, whether by rotating through ETFs or creating more synthetics. Well, with call options, when you exercise, the seller must deliver the security by T plus 2. They're not 100% sure on this area, so they love some help, but they heard that MM exemption that they get T plus 6. So here's OCC clearing rules. Rule 910 Part B. If the delivering clearing member has not completed a required delivery by the close of business on the delivery date, the receiving clearing member shall issue a buy-in notice in paper format or in automated format through the facilities of a self-regulatory organization that provides an automated communication system with respect to the undelivered units of the underlying security within 20 calendar days following the delivery date and shall thereupon buy in the undelivered securities. So with regular shares, you get T plus two before FTD, but market, shakers, market makers get T plus 35 before getting in trouble being forced to buy in. Like they said, in the case that they had a month to juggle things around, but with exercise call options, if they fail at T plus two, they are immediately forced to buy, to issue a buy-in of the underlying, which happened within 20 days. That's why Thomas Peter Fye was very, very upset in January, as he said, according to current rules, brokers would need to go into the market and buy the shares. That's only a small piece of why call contracts are so deadly. They would argue what's more important is the leverage. So now we know that DRS is the way. With DRSing, they need to collectively purchase and register something like 50 million shares to lock the float. At current prices, that means that we need to register $7 billion worth of GME shares. As you all know, the price of GME is volatile, same thing with AMC, and that is bound to go up over time. With call options to lock the same 50 million contracts, we would need say 50 million shares. We would need to own 500,000 contracts. We don't want to buy low delta crap, so a contract can be expensive. But at say $3,000 per contract, we'd only need to invest 1.5 billion to lock the float. So what probably makes even scarier sense for hedgies is that there are several hundred thousand of us. So unlike DRS, which is going to go slow, that is something that's actually attainable if it catches on. We also know that there is going to be somewhere between 10 to 20 million shares locked via DRS. And this is great because it plays into making calls that are much deadlier. Remember back to Peter Fye interview, he said we had 50 million registered shares. By we, he meant the NSCC members who can pass those around through the share borrow program, i.e. brokers. Well, now we only have maybe 30 million registered shares. The point is, statistically, some percent of in-the-money calls contracts are going to be exercised. Market makers know this and can probably delay hedging until they absolutely must do it. So when do they have to hedge? When they do the math and recognize that they are about to owe a lot of shares to those that do choose to exercise. It's a mental game, right? It's you guessing how much of the, the coupons for a Best Buy are going to actually be cashed in, right? They probably think that a good amount of them might actually just end up in an old cupboard somewhere, right? Your call options. You're probably not paying attention. However, if they have the understanding, the same, the same understanding, a, a, a showdown at noon, at high noon, and they flinch, that is the squeeze itself. Last time around, we know the number was around 150 million shares worth of calls that they were short on. Their hypothesis is that would take much less these days because we are likely even more short than they were last year. And we have locked up a significant portion of the float. 
I don't think it's possible to know an exact number, but we are here to make waves. So let's make it clear. Options are dangerous. They're dangerous, okay? If you don't understand them, don't play them. This is not financial advice. But the most important part of it is understanding how, at a macro scale, this all comes together. So if this video was interesting or entertaining or it made your Sunday just a little bit better, make sure to slap that like. Spread this message out to more and more people. Check out a different video in the playlist down below or being shown to you on one of the sides of the screen. Hey, thank you those of you who make this show possible. Like those of you who have gotten the 20, 30% discounts on Chatterquant and Lux, two great tools that will be able to give you guys satisfaction in understanding which of your trades make the most statistical sense at which momentum-based play. And then finally, thanks to those of you who have pressed that join button next to the subscribe button and those of you who have pressed the Patreon button down below. I appreciate you guys, and we'll see you on Monday in the money. Peace.